Hi. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Burns, and today I'll be starting, I'll be showing, I'll be talking about how we can use past data to verify giant sea, sea bass spawning using auditory and visual observations. Um, before I go into that, I just want to give you a little bit of a brief roadmap about what I'm going to be talking about today. So today I'm going to talk a little about me, and then I'll be talking about um, some background about fish behaviors and reproduction, and then I'll be talking about my study species, and then we'll talk about my research, what my plan was, and then what we got, and also some surprises along the way that kind of put a little bit of bumps in the road, and then we'll talk about how these surprises impacted my research. So let's begin. So uh, for about me, um, I'm, from, I, I'm, I'm from the California State University of Northridge. I'm part of the Larry Allen Dr. Mike Franklin's fish lab. And this is also part of the Near Shore Marine Fish Research Program. I just finished my second year of my master's program, yay. Um, unfortunately due to COVID, that's gonna be extended into a four year program. So I'm a third year gonna be staying for another extra year, which is too bad, but it's all right. You know, I'm just starting my career out and you know, it, there's a lot of time left, so it's not too bad to add, tack on an extra year. So how did I get here um, to becoming a marine biologist and studying marine biology? Well, um, what happened was is that uh, I've grown up in LA all my life, and we were a very, very outdoorsy sort of family. Um, we were always out and camping and out in the woods and uh, going to the beach constantly. Uh, the ocean was never too far away from where I lived, and it didn't matter how long it took to get there, we would drive there and do what we needed to do to, in order to enjoy the ocean. So one of the things, sorry, uh, so one of the things that really heavily in influenced me from a young age that I remember vividly were these Jacques Cousteau coffee table books that we had. And these things were huge. Um, you can see me right here. When I was this age, they'd look up like half of me and they were pretty heavy, like a couple pounds. And I remember I'd fall asleep, like laying, like, you know, sleeping in my bed, reading these amazing table books. Um, and so that got me really interested into learning about the ocean. I wanted to consume everything that was ocean, documentaries, books, anything I could. Um, and so another thing that I fell in love with was orcas. And um, at a young age, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to train. I want to ride orcas. That's my goal. And then I kind of found out later, my parents were like, oh, it's not really a great career opportunity. I was like, well, if I can't uh, train them or ride them, I want to study and learn everything about them. And so like in elementary school, I remember having the thought that if I couldn't do that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a marine biologist. And that's and ever since then, I've had this vivid memory, like all the way through my life, that's all I've ever wanted to do was to study the ocean. So finally got into college. I um, actually go to, I went at, for my undergrad at California State University in Northridge. That was my undergrad too, actually. And so I finally got in there. I was in a good marine biology program and people started asking me, Elizabeth, so you're, you're going to be a marine biologist. Cool. What do you want to study? You want to study like Arctic climates? Yes. Do you want to say coral? Yes. Do you want to say deep sea? I was like, yes. Well, what do you, like, okay, that's great. You want to study all these things, but, like, you have to start with somewhere first. And that was my problem. I didn't know what I wanted to start with. I just wanted to do everything. And everything sounded cool, which is great, but you need to start somewhere. So in my junior year, I signed up for a program that would take place in my senior year, which is called the California State University Catalina Island Marine Biology Semester that actually takes place at Wrigley. And so at this program, you basically are there from August to December and you eat, sleep, breathe marine biology, you take all your classes there, you do research there. And that program was life changing for me. Um, I had so much fun. I was so tired, but I had, I learned so much there. And it's thanks to the CAT semester at Wrigley actually that I found out that I was eight, like what I wanted to study in marine biology and that I was actually able to become a, a, a marine biologist, that I had what it took to be a field scientist and take data and do science in general. And so with it, I gained a bunch of experience and I figured out what direction I wanted to take because I was studying all these things. And so when I found out that I was really interested in kelp forest ecology, not only that, but like the animals with the, within them and more specifically the fish that are in them. And so I particularly wanted to know what, why the fish do what they do when they're doing what they do. As my uh, advisor, Michael Franklin, always says, I really wanted to hear, hear about their behaviors and learn about them, and especially because the fact that people don't really know that fish actually have these really, really complex behaviors. It's pretty unknown. And one of the most uh, complex behaviors are reproductive behaviors. 
So why is it important to study reproductive behaviors? Well, by understanding an organism's reproduction, you can understand their expanded behavior oncology and how they at interact with not just in their daily life, but other organisms and other organisms that are part of their same species. Not only that, you can understand their higher order ecology and how they interact with their environment, what they do to their environment. So like um, if they, if a, you know, when birds migrate or when, if an animal migrates somewhere to go spawn or go lay eggs, like butterflies, like monarch butterflies, you can also understand their life history. So their life history are things that are happening during their life, their stages of their life. And reproduction can be a big stage for some of these animals' life. And so how an organism goes about producing offspring can often explain why an organi organism is the way it is. So a really good example is our salmon. So salmon, if you don't know about salmon, salmon spend their whole life in the ocean. They're, they, they're born in the, the freshwater streams and they migrate to the ocean. When it's time to reproduce, they only have one reproductive event per lifetime and they put all their energy into reproducing, getting back to the freshwater upstream where they first were born. And so this process changes them entirely. In fact, it makes them completely different and, it, and where they go to reproduce and lay their eggs also changes the whole ecosystem around them and becomes very dependent on it. So it's really important to understand how reproduction matters because it's a big process and a big part of a lot of organisms' lives. So, Two of the most common behaviors that you'll see that, uh, that fish have are, uh, are courtship and sound production. So people don't really know that fish have these intricate behavior ecologies. And so they do things like courtship rituals, which are basically just um, think about uh, like any dances that you may see in birds. That's, it's, a, it's a very general ex explanation, but some fish do the little dance or they, you know, build something to show off the other fish and the fish will be like, oh man, that's a really nice thing you built for me. Let's have a kid together. You obviously got your stuff down. One of the things that people don't know a lot about is that fish actually can produce sound. And so courtship rituals and sound production are two of the most common behaviors, but people don't know a lot about sound production. So how fish vocalize is and what they use it for are a couple of interesting things. So fish will use uh, vocalizations for interspecific communications. So basically talking to each other within your species, like, hey dude, this is my spot, please go away. Or, hey, this is my lady, I'd like to spawn with them. That's the way they can combat competitors or uh, people who, or other members of their, of their species that they don't, that they want to make sure they don't take the resources from. They can also do it to tell other people, other uh, species to back off. Not only that, but they use these vocalizations as a way to signal readiness to actually mate with the opposite uh, member of the, their opposite gender. So recently, it's been shown that vocalizations have actually been related to a lot of re sound uh, reproduction events that happen with fish. So you might be asking, well, how is it that fish produce this sound? Well, they do it via their, their gas-filled swim bladders. So a lot of fish have uh, gas-filled swim bladders that come from filtering out oxygen from their lungs and they put it into their bladders. And when they wanna go up, they inflate it, their swim bladders, and they deflate it when they wanna go down. So they have sonic restrictive muscles that run the length and are associated with their, with, their with their swim bladders. When the muscles rapidly contract, this will cause the, sp the, the swim bladder to vibrate just like a drum. And it's been shown that this is actually very common in many different fish species. And that it's been, uh, and sound production has actually been used and being studied a lot more. So, reproductive behaviors and fish allow for them for, allow for other fish to identify potential mates and that's and, and identify each other, evaluate how well the mates are, if they're healthy, and synchronize fertilization. So a really good example is over here. You can see these are three spine sticklebacks and they'll do a little dance. The female will come up and dance and she'll look at the belly of the fish and say, oh, that is an opposite gender of my species. I think he might be a good mate. Checks out the, gen checks out the, the color. He's getting new, good nutrition. He can fend for himself. They check, he checks, she checks out the dance. Oh, he can do the dance. Checks out the nest he built and goes, oh, I know exactly where to leave my, uh, leave my eggs so you can fertilize them. And so all these behaviors together help signal how well the, the male is doing, if the male is healthy, and, and uh, if the male is part of her species, and, if, and when and if to release your gametes at the same time so you guys can actually fertilize successfully. Now, for a lot of the times, this is let threatened fish don't actually have any of this in behavioral ecology incorporated into their management strategies because it's really hard to study these behaviors underwater as opposed to being on land. Um, so this can negatively affect recovery efforts. And not only that, 
by understanding these reproductive events, we can help them uh, threatened species recover quicker. So speaking of threatened species, this is the species I study, this giant sea bass. It's a critically endangered marine fish. It is the apex predator of the California kelp forest. It is the largest bony fish off the coast of California, weighing over 400 pounds. It is long living, can live past 72 years in age, and it's slow growing, sexually maturing between ages 11 to 13 years old. So giant sea bass used to be found all the way from Humboldt Bay to the Gulf of California. At present day, most of the population is found South Point Conception to Baja California. This change in distribution was due to overfishing. So in the early 1900s, uh, people started to find out about this amazing cool fish that was not only big but tasted good, the giant sea bass. And so because it was a great trophy and it tasted really good, people started to heavily fish them. So in the early 1900s, they really went after them, causing the population to crash pretty much within a few, like a decade, within a decade almost. And ever since then, the, po the population was being heavily fished. And so all the way in 1980s, they tried to put a moratorium on banning all recreation fishing. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. They implemented the uh, gill net ban and they banned the use of, they banned, banned commercial selling. Unfortunately, in 1996, giant sea bass was placed as critically endangered. But after 20 years of all these protections, slowly but surely the giants have started to recover and their population is growing ever so slowly. Uh, we believe there's actually less than, their population ranges from like 200 to like less than 2,000 individuals in the wild. So because the population is slowly but surely increasing, we are able to study them more. And recent research, especially from my lab, has shown that there's actually constant and consistent, well, there's actually consistent spawning aggregations that come to Tana Carolina Island every summer from June to August. And we actually found out what time they actually spawn, which is between dusk and early morning. Unfortunately, even though we've learned all these new things about, about giants, there's a lot of their behaviors that are still undescribed. And so why is it important to study giant sea bass? Well, they're ecologically significant. They're at the top of the trophic level, which means that they're important regulator for their ecosystem and the other populations of fish that are in the environment. They help keep an ecosystem healthy. Not only that, a giant sea bass caught can go for $12,600, that's $13 per pound. So they're worth a lot economically. But not only that, a live giant sea bass contributes $2.3 million to our, to our ecotourism industry every year in California. John, uh, people Divers are actually willing to pay between $25 to $32 just to swim with giants. Not even the guarantee that they'll see one, but just for the opportunity to even swim with them. And so clearly they are important. Not only are they clearly important for our, for our ecosystems, for our environment, but for our e economy. And unfortunately, because they're critically endangered, we don't know a lot about them. And a key piece of the puzzle is missing, and that's reproduction. So this is the questions I hope to answer with my uh, master's thesis project. I'm really going to be focusing on uh, the first question today, but after this, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we know about giants and what we've found out about them to help make my research pop possible. So I want to know what giant sea bass, if they do produce sound during spawning, what does the giant sea bass courtship look like? And if you see these two things happen at once, can this verify spawning? Does it happen at the same time, meaning that spawning events have happened? And if that means that they happen at the same time, that means spawning's happening, and that means more babies are being produced, which is good for giants. So. What do giants What do giants sound like? Well, thanks to past data collected by my lab, um, we know actually know what giants sound like. So they have their the sound they produce sounds a lot like an underwater boom, and it's a frequency between 40 and 80 hertz. And so it kind of sounds like a kick drum. I'll go back again. So it kind of sounds like that. So when these booms are observed before the booms, the giant sea bass will explain these aggressive traits. You'll see them right here. These fins they display they extend their fins and they raise them up and make them look as big as they can so they're big and scary and then they'll show the whites of their eyes and be really aggressive. When they do that, a boom happens and causing the surrounding fish in the area to flee. I'll play it again. Now, you might notice, dang, that does not sound like a kick drum. Why is that so different? Well, just like how if you were going to yell out loud in the air and then yell into a pool, like put your head in the water and yell and scream in a pool, your voice is going to sound really different. And it's the same thing for giant sea bass. Underwater, their booms sound a lot more like a kick drum, but above air, like I have a recording of, the sound doesn't travel as well. And you think, well, it's still recording, it's still recording. If you recorded a muffled underwater scream by somebody swimming in a pool, it's still going to sound like a muffled underwater scream. So it won't actually sound like a weird, it will sound really weird when you play it above air, um, in the air. So this is all designed to be a boom that sounds really impactful underwater. 
And because it's a, because they cause other fish to flee, we believe that it's an aggressive trait that will ward off competitors or other fish. So that and warding off competitors is a way to protect your mate. So we kind of know what joints sound like. What do they look like when they're doing their courtship and their spawning? Well, we have three, is, we have three easy steps for what possible courtship can look like. What happens is, is there'll be a female resting at 10 to 30 meters in the bottom. If she deems him worthy, a male will approach and she de deems him worthy, he'll follow her deeper. They'll start to circle on the seafloor and then start circling and swimming up through the water column. As they're doing this, the male will nudge her on, on her abdomen, telling her that he's ready for her to release gametes. Then they keep doing this until they reach the surface where they may or may not release gametes or, or, or reach their gametes in the water to signal fertilization. Now, if there is no release of gametes, they can do this over and over and over again. And the thing is that this has never been observed in the wild, but this whole process has been observed over and over again, but never with the result of spawning happening. They've seen it, but never with the release of gametes. So, where I collect my data is at these points in Catalina. Um, it's, it's at Go Harbor, Casino Point, and Little Farmsworth in Pebbly Beach. And so, at these sites, what I do is I put out an underwater microphone called a sound trap an, or a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone. And there it records uh, audio at the spawning aggregation sites during times of their spawning, which is at around dusk till early in the morning. So that covers co co recording the sound bits. Now we gotta cover recording the actual courtship behaviors, which is the visual part of my research. So meet Bruce, this is my Bruce. Bruce is an underwater ROV. He's a remote operated vehicle submersible and I can record him at a distance and he has a little camera on the front and so he video records things with lights. And this is very good for me because if you've ever been to Catalina, it can get kind of crazy at certain times of the year, a lot of boat traffic. And so because these uh, giants spawn at night, it can get a little dangerous for me to do any underwater diving. So this makes it a lot safer for me so I don't have to be in the water when boats are racing around. So. By observing these courtship and sounds with the end product of being release of gametes and using these audio, un, audio and, vis, and visual observations, we'll be able to fully understand the whole process that is their spawning. And with that, we can understand how they produce babies more and we can help them better protect them by understanding what the conditions they need in order to successfully reproduce. So last summer was my first field, field season, summer 2019. I'm ready to go. Got Bruce, got, got a microphone what could go wrong well in 2019 we got a surprise these are were our three giants that were in a tank and they had babies no one was expecting them to spawn babies in fact we were all away when they did it and so i split my time from wrigley and i decided to focus all my time on getting uh, data that was in a tank because we thought it must be easier if it's all crammed into one tank to be able to record something than going out in the field and trying to record something that's in a vast ocean even though we know where they are, if it's in a controlled environment, like a pretty, you know, it's, it's not a huge tank, it's not a giant tank, but it's a pretty good sized tank, but it's still enough that's controlled environment to get the best optimal results. And so these are some of the babies that we collected in 2019. And so they all grew up actually. And so we had like over 400 babies, a lot of baby giants everywhere. They went out to some aquariums. In fact, even Wrigley has some baby giants with them and I can't wait to see them. I'm a proud auntie, I can't wait to see them. I saw them when they were just a little tiny babies. Um, so where did they all go, all these babies? Well, we gave them to not only some aquariums, some aquariums got them, but we also gave them to Cabrillo Marine Aquarium and uh, Aquarium in Long Beach, two very capable facilities that raise these little, these little guys really, really well. And we got a special, um, we got a special uh, uh, permission to release these baby giants back into the wild. And so in spring 2020, uh, we released them in the wild and LA Times did an article on it. You can look that up, baby giants go back in the wild by the LA Times. Not only that, but in spring 20, uh, in September 25th in 2019, we released the parents back into the wild. We were already planning to do so and we couldn't keep them for any longer. So it was time to go back. So I was like, ah, great. Awesome, perfect time. I can't wait. Uh, we don't have to worry about the giants anymore. I have, uh, you know, the giants are out in the wild, the babies have been released. I'm ready for summer 2020 to start my field season again, you know. Uh, it was great what happened last year, but 2020 is gonna be great. Well, we all know what the second surprise was that stopped me from doing my field season in 2020. Um, and so unfortunately, even though I couldn't collect my own data this year, I plan to do it next year, um, hopefully. 
Um, but while I was waiting on trying to figure out what I could do this summer because I couldn't collect field data, we remembered that we had a lot of past sound data that still needed to kind of be looked through again. And that was taken by former, my former lab mates, Parker, JR, uh, pa Parker House and J.R. Clark. And they were also past Wrigley Fellows. And so they had these spawning, uh, they had the sound data that was taken at spawning aggregation sites that were there, that, that had spawning giant sea bass there in 2014 to 2015. And so instead of saying, you know, this is how I looked at all these sounds, I thought it'd be more fun to kind of actually show you guys um, what I was actually looking at and do a little demo with you and how I look for giant sounds. So we're gonna do that real quick. And uh, I use a program called Audacity and it's a free program. And so I'll show you how I do the process because I thought that'd be a lot more fun than uh, just showing you a bunch of pictures and stuff. So I'm gonna go on my giant sea bass drive. We're gonna go to the sound trap 2014. I'm gonna go here. And so as you can see, this is a bunch of data. This is two days worth of data. There's five minute intervals in between each sound recording. And so I'm gonna try to pick a really good one for you guys. So let's see. We're gonna pick it late at night or maybe towards 10 o'clock would be better. Let's see what we got. So this is uh, 2014, July 8th, 2020, uh, let's do, let's like, oh, yeah, let's do that one. Boom. So I'm gonna open it up and we're gonna look for something. Uh, this one doesn't look as fun. So what I do is this is all like the beginning of the microphone. It's just a bunch of beeps. So I cut this off and we're gonna play it and we'll see what we got. Let's hope we got something good. My bad. Hmm? Oops, sorry. I'm trying to see if you guys can hear that. Interesting. Oh, let me fix that real quick. Sorry about that. Now let's see if you guys can hear it. Aha. So you might say, what the heck is all that? That sounds nothing like what you showed me. Well, this right here is shrimp popping. And we have some other really interesting sounds that are over here that I kind of want to look at. Um, what we're looking for is we're looking for these really big, if you remember the, the graphs, we're looking for something like this, a really big boom. And I'll show you these in a second. These are called spectrograms. So we're looking for really big booms, something that's going to show up because these uh, giants make a really loud sound. So let's look at this real quick. Hmm. So this doesn't really look like a boom. It's not very good, but you know, something might be hidden. Maybe the giant is far away. So we're gonna zoom back out and we're gonna do a spectrogram. And we're gonna see what this, what this looks like. So we're gonna change settings real quick. All, all the fish sounds that we care about happen in this frequency, max frequency. And we're gonna put it the optimal window for viewing, get rid of some stuff we don't need. All right, so giants booms happen Around here, we want to look, and this is a frequent, this is 100, and this is 50, and this is zero. So we're looking for something like this. Even something like this would be helpful. And I don't see this at all here. So I would say even though it was very interesting sounds, we don't have anything. This is the beginning of the microphone firing, and this is the end of the microphone firing. That's what these are. So all these things are just sounds that, unfortunately, even though they're cool, I don't really care about. But just like Martha Stewart, I have a prepared clip beforehand. So while I was practicing this talk, I actually found a boom, just, just opening up random files like I was trying to do with you guys. And so I love to show it to you guys. Okay, so first thing you notice, it's very different about this file. It's longer. So that makes it a little bit different and a little bit more difficult to look at, but it's all right, we'll just zoom in. So I'll play this for you real quick and you can see how different it is. So we still have more shrimp popping. We can hear some other stuff too. I don't know if you heard the little flick. That might be more shrimp, flick and tail flick. But we're not sure, because I can't really tell. But this right here is where we want to look at. 
This is very interesting. That was loud. And that traveled. So, we'll stop it. Let's look at this sucker right here. We're going to zoom in. So it kind of looks kind of promising. If you see right here, we got some very, very, very big loud sounds. And if I even slow it down, because sometimes listening to something slower actually can help us. So let's listen to this. That's a, bo that's a boom. So these are booms that I have to look at and compare to. So that might be it. But we don't know for sure because we got to look at the frequencies. So we got to compare it in a graph because that could still be another fish, another shrimp sound. Mm, look at that. That's really interesting to look at. Look how big it is. So I'm going to change it again so we can get rid of some extra data that's in the way, make it harder to look at. Put it the optimal window. Okay, so what's really cool about this is how it's a big line. That could be another, that could be another sh uh, shrimp sound or it could not because we have something like this. It could just be really far away. I'm also very interested, I don't know if you guys saw it, over here. This guy looks very interesting. Let's play him. And you might say, Elizabeth, I didn't hear anything. That's because some booms created by giants are too hard for us to hear. Our human ears don't hear it. Even if it's through a microphone or even through headphones. So if I play this again, you can kind of hear a, a slight thump. So if you had really good bass speakers, you might be able to hear this really well. And I have really good like $200 headphones that I use um, to listen to these sounds. And so this one is very interesting to me because it looks a lot like these things. But this first one over here, I'm pretty sure we have a boom, at least somewhere in here. This is really cool. And so when I was practicing this talk, I just opened this up randomly and I found it. And as you can see, it kind of happens at a weird time, but it's really cool, I think. Um, this boom, so this is how I look for booms. I go through all that other data, as you saw that other boring data, right? It's not boring. None of the data is boring. It's all inform informative. But here, it doesn't really tell you much. So I listen to a lot of this stuff. And because I listen to stuff that doesn't always have booms in it, I'm able to better identify what could be a boom and what could be a shrimp pop. And so what I do is after I'm done, I take the, the nice little title up here and I put it in my Excel sheet and then I put the contents of what it is. So sometimes I hear a rumble, I hear a lot of boat noise, and then I put a thing back here to say why I should go back to look at it. Because even though I think this sounds a lot like a boom, the other, uh, sorry, the other one, even though I think this sounds and looks a lot like a boom, I have to do a little bit more research on it. And because I have so much data, I can't look at everything in depth all the time. So I have to put a bookmark on it and then come back to it later. So this is how I look at booms. I think it's pretty interesting. Sometimes you hear stuff like that. I heard a diver scream into a microphone one time. That was a little scary. Um, but that's how I look at sounds. And I have two summers worth of that. And sometimes they went to six months of it. So um, please stay tuned for better, for more accurate results and better uh, discussion about what I got. So. Why does this matter? Why does studying this matter at all? Well, recent studies have shown that fish calls are actually a way to take an accurate census of a population of giant sea bass. Not only that, giant sea bass are slow glowing and long lived and takes, their, takes them longer periods of time to recover their population sizes. By documenting and identifying giant sea bass vocalization, we can do accurate population counts by just hearing their booms in the distance without even actually doing any visual observations because giants like, like to hang out in deep waters, which makes it harder to sometimes see them. Not only that, this will help track, track population sign, sizes and it'll help identify areas of use. So if we hear booms in one area, we know that they're using that area. And also, if they're doing courtship in that area, we know that they're probably spawning. If they're happy at the same time, we'll know that this is a place of spawning aggregation. And that might be an area that we might have to protect because this critically endangered species can only spawn in so many different areas. And this, on the whole, by understanding what their spawning looks like and what their spawning sounds like will help us understand their very important life history event. One little thing, I know I'm kind of short on time. Another thing to remember is that black sea bass is not the name of giant sea bass. We had to change the name because black sea bass are actually a very, very popular game fish uh, that are on the East Coast. And so uh, if you search black sea bass, you will always get this fish. In fact, Noah has a page on them. They're very popular game fish. So. 
Don't call giant sea bass a black sea bass. It's a lame name anyways. You want to be called giant sea bass. Giant sea bass is so much cooler, like a, like a dinosaur or something. So remember to call them a giant sea bass. And also, if you go to the Sea of Cortez, you can fish them legally. But please remember that their population size is very low. And so this guy is at least 20 years old. This one is at least a teenager right here. So it takes them 13 years to get to this big. So if you keep, if we fish them, overfish them like this, they won't be able to replenish their population very well. And we'll be back at square one. So call them giants. Don't fish them in Mexico. I'd like to thank all these people, my advisors, Larry Allen, Mike Franklin, wonderful uh, collections, boat safety manager, Mike Abernathy, my lab, the USC uh, Bailey Summer Fellowship. Without you guys, I wouldn't, the fellowship, I wouldn't have a research project. I'd like to thank my family and friends. I'd also like to thank the staff at UC Wrigley and USC Wrigley itself. The staff at UC Wrigley are so supportive, kind, and helpful. I would not be able to do a lot of my stuff without you guys. So I really always want to make sure that you guys are shouted out properly because you guys do a lot of work. And you don't get the recognition, you sometimes don't get the recognition you deserve. So without you guys, Wrigley wouldn't be running. I want to say thank you to that. I also want to say thank you to my dive buddies and to SCMI. SCMI did a great job of taking care of these fish. They put their heart and soul into loving our giants and I want to give them something back. So thank you, thank you Wrigley, thank you SCMI, thank you my advisors, thank you my family. And if you guys have any other further questions, unfortunately I can't answer them right now, but if you contact me via social media on my Twitter, you, I'll certainly answer you back. I also have a YouTube channel, which I do tend to post some interesting clips that I find during my research, like a diver yelling into my microphone that scared that scared me quite well. Um, so you can check that out. You can see what things I've saw and um, I post things that I'm allowed to post because sometimes you gotta save that for the research paper. Uh, it's been great talking guys. I hope you enjoyed the talk and learned a little bit more about giant sea bass.